Good evening. Welcome. This is a training that took place at QC on February 11th, 20, uh, February 11, 2020 for CLET on Queen's College campus. My name is Dr. Linda Lighton, and I am married to the love of my life, Reverend Milton Lightborn, the minister of Ebenezer Methodist Church. And this year, 2020, we will, have we will celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Together, we have three young adults. Kuja, on the left, is a pediatric cardiology nurse, and we are very proud of Katrina. She is, she is part of a team that puts in a device into a child's heart that keeps the heart functioning until they are able to get a, a transplant, a heart transplant. Karen, on the right here, she is the Vice President for Strategy and Innovation for Humana Insurance, which has 41,600 employees serving 13 million Americans. We're very proud of her. And just last week, she was appointed to the board of directors for that company, and we're so great. My son, our son Curtis, there's 10 years between Curtis and Karen. And um, when he was 10, I'll tell you this, when he was 10, I asked him what he wanted to do with his life. And he said, I don't know. And that's not an answer that I can that I can live with. So I said, you need to find out who you belong to, who you are, who loves you, who cares for you, and what, you're going, what your purpose is in life. You have seven days and 18 hours, and we'll have this conversation again next Tuesday at six o'clock. And he did, he did some soul searching. He did some digging into himself to find out who he was and who, who, who he was supposed to become. And he told me, or I told him at, at that time, I told him that if he didn't make up his mind, that I was gonna push him into aviation and he'd have to be a pilot. He could live my dream instead of his. And so he came up, we had this conversation the next week and he said, um, yeah, I do wanna go into aviation, but I don't want to be a pilot, I want an engineer and I want to work with engines. I said, okay, that's something I can live with. Fast forward 14 years from that conversation and Curtis is an engineer. He graduated from Cincinnati University with uh, honors and now he's working with GE Aviation and he's on a team of engineers, 15 engineers, whose job it is to design Black Hawk helicopter engines. So he is living in his purpose and we're very proud of all three of our children. We had four grandchildren, range age from two to 13. Here are some possible reasons why I've been asked to teach this class. I have a bachelor's in music education with a minor in Bible. I have a master's in, in business administration, a master's in education, a master's in organizational leadership, and an earned doctorate in educational leadership that gives me a license to be superintendent of schools and or professor, facilitator, or regional dean of university. I have 17 years of experience as a department head of a high-performing public school, 10 years as an adjunct professor of Indiana Wesleyan University, where over 2,000 students have come through my classes on their way to an associate degree, bachelor's degree, or master's degree. Let's pray. Dear Father, I pray that together we will learn what you would have us to learn as we seek to improve the way we conduct the business of our local churches. We want to serve you in the best possible manner a manner pleasing to you and beneficial to the sheep of your pasture. We ask these things with thanksgiving to you in none other name but the mighty name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.
The agenda for the evening, uh, there's four things that I really want us to focus on and look at together. First, we're going to do specifically meetings. Then we're going to go to what is a vision and what are values, what are goals and what are our objectives and why they are important. And then we're going to go through the decision-making process. And then um, we're going to go through adoptable and adaptable habits that help us look beyond ourselves and situations to see alternatives for dealing with crises. Why do we use Robert's Rules of Order? Or do we use Robert's Rules of Order? I'm suggesting that it would be a good idea to use Robert's Rules of Order because, number one, it's the international standard for conducting meetings. It helps you to use a language that is universally accepted. It helps us to bring a sense of universality, lang language, when important matters are being discussed. And then I'm going to interject here that if someone comes there and say, well, the Lord told me to, or the Lord has suggested to me that I should, or we should, or the church should go in this direction, it sounds wonderful to have someone say, the Lord told me, we want the Lord to tell us things for sure, but it's, it's subjective. It's, it's very subjective. It's not an objective way to, to handle business as we know it. We do want the law's input, but we want to make sure that the person who is talking is actually hearing from God and not just reacting to some piece of cheese that they ate that did not settle well. It gives you a sense, it gives your meeting a sense of orderliness. It gives you the language for but in starting a meeting, we're going to call the meeting to order. When you call the meeting to order, you do a roll call, and those who are absent um, may have sent apologies, in which case you read those apologies. You have to establish a quorum. A quorum is two-thirds of voting members, specifically voting members, because at board meetings, other people can come, trust can come, other people can come, concerned people can come, but in order for a quorum to be established, you have to have two-thirds of voting members to be present for a meeting to take place. You can't say, okay, there's only five of us. That's only 50%. That is not two-thirds. Two-thirds is seven out of every 10. If there's 10 members on the, on the board, seven of them have to be there in order for, the, for a quorum to be established and um, business to be conducted. That is very important. It's a legal issue. Okay, so then you're going to read the previous minutes. When they are read, and if they are accepted as they are, or there's no, no further business that needs to be adjusted, or if the things are in order and spoken correctly, written correctly, then someone has to make a motion to adopt the minutes as read by saying, I move that the minutes be adopted as read. And then someone else will say, I second. And all in favor will say, I, all opposed say, nay. And then that will determine who has it. If the I's and the nays sound to you or sound to somebody there that they are not equal, then you can go for a roll call. And each person you go through, each person say, this person says I, this I say, you say you what your name is, Linda Lightborn, I, um, Milton Lightborn, nay, go through and, and count and have a count of who it is so that you know exactly how many people say I, how many people say nay, okay? That is if you, if you don't have a unanimous I or a unanimous nay. All business, then you start talking about all business arising from the board minutes. Here there have, can be any actions, have there been actions since the last meeting? And then you go to reports from committee chairpersons. Now before the meeting, decide on how many reports you're going to have that day. It's a good idea to decide that you're going to have so many, um, hear from so many committees on a particular board meeting. You can't hear from everybody. That will take the whole night. Okay? And then you don't want to hear the whole report. Maybe you'll have people giving you a report every month, but only four people, 
four people will give a summary report, a summary report. We did this, we did this, we did this, and we plan to do this and this and this. And you don't need to get to a situation where you have um, someone, good, well-meaning person in the nursery giving a five-page report while you all there sit and listening to a five-page report on the nursery. You don't need that. You do need to hear from the nursery, but it doesn't need to be a long drawn out report. A report is necessary for the archives, but it, the whole thing does not have to be spoken at the meeting. So instead of hurting people's feelings, we're going to say, okay, we are hearing from four, these four committees today, and we're hearing from these four committees next week. Put, in, put them in a roster. Let them know that they, they are important, their ministry is important, but we're only going to hear from four each time, even though we're going to get a full written report each time. Then you open the floor for new business. Hopefully some of that has come together in the form of a, an agenda so that you know um, who will speak, who will take the floor. Open the floor with discussion and a decision is made whether to vote on acting upon items raised from the floor or whether it needs more understanding or if there needs to be more inf information, more investigation. If it's an urgent thing and the meeting is about this, something from the floor, it may address an action. It may need to be addressed in action before the next meeting. And that's something that you will decide together. At the end of your meeting, you say, I move that this meeting be adjourned and someone else will second it. All in favor say aye. Very important to keep the language straight. Now I want to talk about the personalities of the chairperson. It doesn't matter what the personality is, it just has to be managed. There are some go-getter go kind who want to do everything themselves and get things done on their own. This is not what a board is for. You don't need a chairperson who just runs ahead and tries to get ahead of the crowd and do everything on. It can be helpful to have a have one such a way, but it can be also harmful. Here we see a go-getter, seeing a shiny object over here, and then they just go after the shiny object, just, just go, just, just go, and then, you know, they kind of fall off the face of the earth. It's not helpful. However, a talker, a personality of a per talker can be helpful or harmful also. Like if you someone who says, well, let's, what do you think? And what do you think? And what do you think? And what's your opinion? You get nothing done. Nothing is done while, while everyone is being heard and being listened to, but nothing is getting done. So you're going to have something in between there. The go-getter who does things before the meeting even comes in a way that you might or may not be the right way or the way that you prefer for it to happen. And then you've got this other way that is, is just awful. Okay, who sets the agenda? According to the Constitution of Bahamas Conference of the Methodist Church, the pastor and the CBC chairperson are to meet together for the express purpose of setting the agenda. We do it together. A secretary records the minutes, types them up and distributes them one to the member board. Secondly, make sure that they are filed in a safe, dry place in date order for reference archives. Know where the archive minutes are kept. Every board member needs to know where the archives are kept. You can't get to the end of the year and say, oh, where are they? Oh, where, where, where are these minutes now? All right. In this day and age, we can put them on the computer and put them in a, in a, a secure file for that, designed for that purpose. It always helps to have policies in place before a situation arises. Sometimes you have to create a policy because of something that has arisen. But over time, 
you can find that policies that are written help keep things in order. Your main reference is the constitution of the, of the Bahamas Conference of the Methodist Church. You have to know what's in the constitution so that you know that you are doing things according to the constitution and you're not out of order. There are life and business issues that come up in church when a policy should be in place. For example, do you have a maintenance policy? You don't have to have a meeting every time the air conditioning filters need to be changed. If you have a policy that says that the air conditioning filters will be changed every three months, then that's what happens. No meeting necessary. If someone on the property board, are they looking at the roof periodically? What about the floors? What about the deep cleaning of the sanctuary? What about the windows? How will they be cleaned? What about the bulbs on the inside and the outside, the instruments? Instrumenting tune, that's, that's huge for me. I'm a, I'm a music major. I play. I play very well. I play organ and I play piano. And I've been to some churches where they can't remember the last time the piano was tuned. They've got keys missing on the piano. They've got this missing. Please, have a policy for how often you miss it to be tuned. I went to one, one place, one church in our conference where the left-hand half of the piano didn't work. It was a beautiful piano, but it didn't work. Come on, people. We can make an, uh, uh, a policy that says they're going to be tuned. You decide. I mean, if you don't have a good piano player or if you don't have a good organ player and you've got guitar soul, then, then you might not want to tune but once a year if you have a piano. But don't let it get into, into such disrepair that it's going to cost you $1,000 to fix all the pieces that should have been fixed year after year after year to stop that from happening, a, a huge bill at the end of 10, 15 years, okay? Um, that's my pet peeve, sorry, I had to go on that one. Then the sound system, make sure it's working properly. It's gotta be working properly for every Sunday. What about the grounds? Pull the weeds, please pull the weeds. Don't let there be weeds growing in. You don't have to have a meeting to decide whether you're gonna cut enough of the weed out of, that's growing in the tarmac or in your parking lot. If you have policies, someone can just go ahead and do it. You don't have to keep redressing that. I think that's understood. What about policies concerning your resident minister? This is not a limited one, a, a limited one, but I just wanted to get your mind thinking about how we're going to treat our minister, how the minister's family is going to be treated what's going to be done and what's not going to be done. Okay, the minister will, will be encouraged intentionally by the heads of various committees in the board. Please, one option for, your, for caring for your minister is to say something good about him, say something encouraging to him. You don't always have to say something awful. We don't have to have a crisis every time you're talking to the minister. It would be nice to have balance. Encourage him as a human being, okay? The only thing that has to happen badly for people who run amok with gossip, half truths, downright falsehoods, and the like, is for the leadership to say nothing. You say nothing, then everything else that is negative even a little bit negative, and the person who said that negative thing can't even remember what they said, but it's gone viral. The minister is, is struggling to, to keep his head above water. Come on, people, we can do better. If we don't say anything good, and people are saying lots of things bad, it becomes true, whether it's true or not. minister will be properly re remunerated, paid, and paid on time. I'm not, old, I'm not so old to where I can't remember where they used to pay the minister with a chicken. You can't take a chicken down to BEC and have them accept the chicken as payment for their utility bill. 
Okay, it, uh, it, it doesn't work that way. Decide on how much you're going to pay your minister and what benefits they're going to be and pay on time. Pay on time, it's not that hard. The minister is a human being. Believe it or not, the minister is a human being. The things that hurt other human beings hurt him or her too. If he or she has a family, make sure you are holding the minister's children to a different standard, a higher standard to what you're holding your children. That's not fair. Children are children, they do things. They're human beings with personalities, dislikes and likes. Be leaders, be intentional in speaking kindly to the children and be leaders in speaking kindly about children. It's important. It's important. The minister's wife, of which I am one. Inherently, out of the nature of the beast is to take everything out on the minister's wife. She's a human being who has made a lot of personal sacrifices to be by her husband's side. When she said, I do, at the altar, however long it was ago, she said, I do to this man. The church wasn't included in the vows. I don't remember saying, I do, to Milton Lightbourne and his congregation. I mean, as to a man, the man that I loved and who I believed loved me and still believe so. And so being unkind to his wife and treating his wife differently to the way you treat him is it's just not fair. It's, it's not fair. It's, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult role and you have to understand that. And so um, be, be kind with your words, be thoughtful with your words to her and about her, in front of her and behind her. Understand, as leaders, understand that it is possible that they treat the minister one way, a good way, a beautiful way, and treat his family and his wife and children another way, a negative way, with the things they say, the things they say about them, the things they say to them. Be aware of that and be proactive in making sure that there's a balance between what is said and what is not said, what is left unsaid to the minister's wife and family. Have a policy for what happens to the minister's family should the minister, God forbid, be ushered into eternity during his ministry at your church. Don't wait for it to happen for, for this discussion to happen. This discussion needs to happen. What happens to his wife and children if, the, if your minister is no longer there? Typically, they will say, thank you for your service. We need the man for the next minister. Now think about that for a minute. It's happened. A minister who had been there for 45 years had a heart attack in the pulpit and died before they got him to the hospital. On Tuesday, they were, the deacons went to mass and said to the wife, we need the manse for the next minister. You're going to have to get out. She had no way to go. Her family was in a different in a different part of the country. And she had absolutely nowhere to go, and she hadn't worked all her life. All she did was fry chicken and, and do hair and anything else that needed to be done in the church. That's what she did. She was right there by her husband's side. Once he was gone, it was a case of she should have been gone too. That's not right. It's not right. Those deacons went to the house on Tuesday and told her that they needed a house for, for the minister. She didn't show up for church next Sunday. And when her friends went to check on her, she died. And I would put it to you that her death was a direct result of the heartbreak she had, number one, from her death of her, sudden death of her husband, number two, the way that the deacons in that church treated her. 
telling her she had to get out. And the only house that she'd lived in for 45 years. We've got to think these things through. So I'm suggesting that we have a key man life insurance policy. The difference between a key man life insurance policy and a regular policy is that you have a specific name on regular life insurance policy. If you have a key man life insurance policy, then the name of the person who is insured changes if your minister goes on and you get another minister. Okay, have a key man life insurance policy in place and keep paying the premiums. Then make it for at least $1.5 million and then split it 50-50. So when you say, thank you for your service, we need the man for the next minister, you're also giving her $750,000 for her to get her life, uh, buy a house and get her life back together with us. You can't leave her penniless, people. You can't do that. You mustn't do that. And it's happened time and time again. Um, my dear friend Cheryl, she lost her husband of 45 years just last year. And the church gave her an offering. They, they collected an offering, collected $4,000 and said, oh, thank you for your service. 35 years, $4,000. If you have a policy in place, you won't have to have that deep conversation when you're in the middle of a crisis. That's my main point. But a key man life insurance policy, every church should have one. Every church should have one. Policies concerning board members. Persons who are given the position of officers, committee chairs, board members, etc., must be in good standing. For attendance, you've got to go to church. You've got to be attending the church. You've got to financially support the church, tithing 10% of your family income. You have to show concern for the well-being of the leadership and the well-being of, of its properties or its property. You can't expect to just come in and just be the, the chairperson without having some commitment to the church. Be, care be very careful there. It's, it can't be, okay, you're the only person who wants to be this position, it's yours. No, you do, do some background on the people who, are, who want to be in positions. Persons who are giving these, given these positions must be tithe paying and giving members to this local body. As CBC chair, spoiler alert, you're not the leader of the church. You're the leader of the board. And, and that idea does have consequences. And, have, you know, if you think you're the leader of the church and you are a dictator kind of leader, you're just taking the church where you think it should go and not where it necessarily should go. Your primary role as board chair and as committee members is to work with the minister, not to work outside of the minister. For example, you do not have the right as a board chairperson or as an um, evangelism committee person, committee chairperson, to go set up a revival and call a visiting minister and advertise what you want to advertise without just getting involved in the minister in every step of the process. If you don't have a minister, a resident minister at that time, then that's different. But if you have a resident minister, make sure you're involving him in every, every facet of the decision making process. You don't just tell him what you all decided to do and the day before the, the, the revival is supposed to start. That's easy to do, especially if you've got one minister and several uh, several churches. He comes once or twice a month. If he's there at all and he's your resident minister, then please do him the respectful thing and involve him in the, in the processes of any decisions that need to be made. Your role is a supportive role, not a takeover role. Communication on all major minor decisions with the minister and other is crucial. B 
BCMC constitution says that if you fail to conduct meetings or miss two or more consecutive meetings, you are no longer eligible to hold the office of chair or board member. When you are voted on, there needs to be an exit strategy, exit policy for anyone who defaults on their commitment. Put it in writing. BCMC constitution says it, and then you have a policy on top of that. You've missed too many meetings. We need to get things done. We need to have meetings. And if it's not happening, ask for their resignation letter. The BCMC constitution says that a voted on committee member or board or board member or council member can only serve six years in aggregate. I mean, six consecutive years. Then she, he or she has to come off the board, committee or council. They can go back after a period of three years has lapsed. But you can't have people on a board and a committee for 14, 15, 16, 20, 25 years. It's not supposed to be that way. They constitute, that becomes an illegal committee if they serve more than six years in the aggregate, six consecutive years. Have a finance policy. How are you going to spend your money? Give 10%, and that's probably going to be demanded by apportionments anyway. Save 10%, which should equal six months of operating costs. Have money set aside that if you should fall short on your, on your offerings, that you can still pay your bills for over a six, months, um, six month period. Okay? Make 10% turn a profit. And what do I mean by that? Trinity is an excellent example of this where they are able to survive and thrive on low numbers because of the rental of parking spaces and office spaces. Think of something that you can invest in, a safe investment that can see you and tide you over in difficult times, times when your members may be losing jobs or have something as, as horrible as Dorian happen, um, Hurricane Dorian happen. Have, have a something, a, 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 a manse. Maybe the, the minister decided to buy his own property. And so you can rent the, the, the manse and that money can go specifically into a into a savings account to be turning a profit for the church. Many things you um, talk to people, talk the thing through because there are many things that can be done. Some people do a, a bake sale or a, a lots of bake sales or chicken fry or you know just just do something that will you can ten percent of your money that will actually make money for the church. Complete a budget for the remaining 70%, 18% salaries, 12% maintenance and utilities and vehicle, 15% operations, 30% on ministry, and 5% special one-time expenses like refurbishing your kitchen, refurbishing this, redoing nothing. Like if it's more than 5% of your total cost, your total budget, the 5%, then then do it 10%, but save the 5% this year and the 5% next year, put the two together, you have your big, your big um, item taken care of that way. The percentages are not fixed, but not doing anything makes you spend off all your money plus some. And that's what I'm trying to help you understand, that if you have um, a percentage, you decide what percentage is, and in deciding so, you can um, save yourself a whole lot of headache when there's too much month at the end of the money. Don't waste time in meetings. You don't have a meeting for no other reason than to decide and have your next meeting. That happens all too often. Time well spent is when, when a specific item is being discussed, budgeted and action. The board members feel respected with their ideas and their thoughts. No one is shut down for their, for their, um, for their ideas. Don't let that happen. Agenda is followed and opinions are heard. 
Just because someone is loud doesn't mean to say they necessarily got the best idea. And just because someone speaks quietly does not necessarily mean that they don't have any say. So keep that, keep that in mind and keep it, keep a balance that way. Okay, we're changing su subjects. We've gone from meetings, what happens in your meetings? What is a vision for your church? A vision is a reflection of what God wants to accomplish through you during an appointed specific time. It has to be an appointed and specific time. It can't be for all time because things change. The minister changes, the board members change. It can't be continuous. It has to be for an appointed amount of time. It might be six months, it might be six weeks, it might be a year, it might be two years, but it has to be a specific amount. A vision is the bridge between the present and the future, and it has four elements. The four elements of a vision are, it allows you to see what is ahead as if you were looking through a telescope. You don't see the details, but you see, okay, this is where we want to go. This is where we want to be. This is how we want to treat each other. In, in look through a telescope. You don't see the details. You see from mountain to mountain. Then the second element is the insight, which means you're looking at the details. And then oversight is put, helps you put life into perspective. And then God's sight assures us that we are hearing from God and not necessarily from something bad that you ate. Helen Keller, she was asked, Helen, Helen Keller was blind, and I'm sure you've heard of her. She was asked, what would be worse than being born blind? And she said, the only thing worse than being blind is to have sight without vision. I'm not taking credit for this quote but I like it. When all you see is what you see, then you still don't see all that there is to be seen. Let me say that again. It's powerful. When all you see is what you see, then you still don't see all that there is to be seen. You are looking at a picture here it's a brilliant artistic piece of work. How many of you see the old lady with a hat on her head? Okay, how many of you see the young lady with a hat on her head? Look closely, see, see which one you see because in this picture, there's a very old lady, and in this picture, there's also a very young lady, and both have a hat on their head. When all you see is what you see, then you still don't know all there is to be seen. Churches who have a vision usually know where they're going, and they're able to persuade others to follow. So the leaders of the church, the board, and the minister together need to craft a vision for a defined period of time. They need to write the vision, make it plain to the congregation, and put it on a tablet. In today's um, time, the tablet would be the bulletin. If you have a screen, if you have an overhead projector and a screen, not an overhead projector, a screen and a projector, Put it up on the, on the screen so everyone sees it every time. And when the vision is cast and you're talking, the member, the leadership is talking about it, then the members need to read it and run with it. Go with the vision. Go with the vision of the leadership of the church. There are consequences for not having a vision. Without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, people wander aimlessly. 
people wander aimlessly in the wilderness of the uh, and lose interest church okay without a vision values goals and objectives people become sloppy in their prayer life in their giving and in their support of the church A consequence is without a vision, the church becomes a gossip machine and a space for verbal and spirited infighting. Without a vision, leadership tends to, leadership tends to close their eyes to the reality of what's going on. Others will manhandle situations in an unprincipled fashion in the church. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And others will take the steering of the ship and run the ship into the ground with the whole congregation on board, no longer able to do anything or say anything. Those are severe consequences. So let's talk about writing a vision statement for our church. It has to be compelling, it has to be achievable, it has to be challenging, it has to be aligned. What do I mean by aligned? That means that, for example, Santa Claus. Santa Claus in a red suit with hair very long and a long beard is not cultural for, for the Bahamas. We have uh, Santa Claus in Bermuda shorts and, and um, short hair. If you were in the cold parts of the United States, yeah, sure, you want him with long hair, Santa Claus with long hair. But here we don't need that. It's not cultural. It's not, histor it's not historical. It's not weatherical, whatever weatherical is. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit our organization. But do we want to be someone who's giving? Sure. Do we want someone to, for our children to look, look to for toys and stuff? Well, sure. Um, but is it Santa Claus? Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. It has to be inclusive. Inclusive. It can't be just for the young people that you're trying to, to attract to the church, keep in the church. And it can't be just for the old people who are paying your money, who are putting their tithes and offerings in the church regularly. Okay. It can be for either one. It has to be for both. It must be distinctive and it must be clear. So here's an example of a church that has 700 people in it. Communities within a community serving God together. In this church that has this vision statement, they have 70, 65 to 70 small groups. The church is first small groups that get together each week to do some kind of social justice, kind of um, working on, on themselves, working on each other. And then they come on Sunday mornings and go to church together. They sit together. They minister together. They do things together inside of the church. It's a wonderful concept. And they've had to two services on a Sunday morning because they can't fit all the people that come in one, in one service. Okay, here's another example. Catch the wave. In a particular church that had this, the minister and the leadership said, we are going to try to attract 900 children and we want to well um, put together VBS this summer, Vacation Bible School, and we want to be ready to work with 900 children. And they did. They marketed themselves. They got the cooks. They got the materials. They got the um, school teachers off for that summer and ran a, a VBS that was out of this world that one time with at 950 children. So they exceeded their goal. Ebenezer says this every morning. Why don't you say it with me? To worship God joyfully, offer Christ faithfully, promote growth hopefully, and serve others lovingly. We say that every Sunday morning. It's on the front of our bulletin. Okay. What is the difference between commandments and core values? 
If you click here, you will find a, a set of core values that you can um, look at at convenience at your leisure if you come back to this, um, this presentation. Essentially, commandments are things and behaviors in which we should not engage. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Shalt not. Okay. Core values, on the other hand, are things and behaviors that we should engage in. Faithfulness, love, joy, growth, commitment. Uh, five examples of core values, excellence, core values that we should engage in at all times. Commandments are things we should stay away from. Core values are things that we should engage in. So one of the, the core values for the church that had, um, <coughs> excuse me, that had communities within a community, their four core values are truth, truth from the word of God, truth to each other, truthfulness in the way we talk to each other, truthfulness in our lives. Truthfulness in how we be, how we treat ourselves. We have to speak truth to ourselves. Justice. We will do social justice. We will be fair. We will be correct in how we deal with every situation. Beauty and intimacy. Intimacy with God. Intimacy within inside of our family. Intimacy in our church family. Intimacy talking about authenticity. We're going to be authentic with each other. That's the four values that they came up with as a board and leadership of the church, and that's how they engage. The, the value, best part of having such a thing is saying that, okay, you said something to me that I'm finding to be not truth, not exactly true or half truth. How does that fit into a value of truth, what you said to me? And when you ask that question, it takes it takes the spotlight off of the person and puts it on behavior. And so you don't get such a negative blowback from that. It's one thing to say, how does that fit with telling the truth? It's a whole lot of difference to saying, you love me. See, then you start accusing the person, even though what you said might be true, it comes across a lot more easily, a lot more palatable, if you will, if you say, I don't know how this fits in with truth, as to say, as opposed to saying, you just lied to me, you know, okay? Ebenezer's core values are joy, faith, hope, love, service, and growth. We speak to those core values every Sunday. When you are making goals, which are based upon your vision and based upon your um, core values, they need to be smart goals. They need to be specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be achievable and relevant and time specific. The relevant part would be, let me give you a business example. You can be the best Horse whip, horse buggy, let me call it a buggy, you, a horse buggy. We see those down in Nassau. There's about four of them that I've counted so far. Four buggies. You can be the best buggy maker on the planet. But if you can only attract four people to buy your buggy, Maybe your buggy is irrelevant. Cars are out now. They're talking these smart cars and these um, cars that are going to drive themselves. If we're still riding a, a Model T Ford, then you know we're just irrelevant. So <laughs> that's that's how you think of that. It's got to be relevant to the time, relevant to your situation, relevant to your culture, relevant to your history, and your future. Okay. When you're setting goals, it's going to be two or three sentences. It's including exactly what is accomplished, and it has a completion date. Those are the elements of a of goal. Answer the question: 
How will you know when the goal is completed? Okay, the birdhouse is built. How will the goal be, how will it be completed? Well, I'm going to buy the materials and I'm going to um, put a roof on, I'm going to put sides on and, you know, I'm going to have my, my, my nice little birdhouse, okay? Who is in charge of completion? Well, answer that question. Which board member, which committee is going to be in charge of declaring this thing completed? Now let's talk a little bit about the decision-making process. Step one, identify the core issue. Some things are not what they would appear to be. If you have a problem with wet carpet, the problem is not wet carpet. The problem is probably a hole in the roof. Okay, so you have to address the hole in the roof and the rotted wood before you can address the wet carpet. So when you are doing, um, you have to identify what the core issue is. You can't be taking things off of the top and thinking that you're dealing with an issue. You're not necessarily dealing with a, with a core issue. You're just dealing with the it's like putting a Band-Aid on a cancer. You can't put a Band-Aid on a ca cancer until the cancer is gone. Okay, <clears throat> so make sure that you're, you're dealing with a core issue. Do a SWOT analysis. What is a SWOT analysis? A SWOT analysis is looking at the strengths of the situation, looking at the weaknesses of the issue, looking at the opportunities of the issue, and looking at the threats of the issue. Going back to our see our room, our ceiling, and our and our carpet. The strength of fixing the roof would be no more water coming in. The weakness, it might be a very expensive project, and we don't have that kind of money right now. An opportunity would be to stop having wet carpet, and a threat would whole ceiling could come down. So. With all those four in mind, what's a good thing to do? Probably um, fix the hole in the roof. Put it in it. Okay. So in your dis decision-making process, you do the SWOT analysis. Decide if the strengths are dominant. If the strengths are more are, are more dominant than the weaknesses, then go with it. If the threats are more threatening than the opportunities, then, then make it a priority. When you're doing your decision-making um, process, the first action item is to do nothing. You write on it, do nothing. That's number one. Because what that does for you is helps you be like, no, -uh, that's not an option. Yes, it is an option, but it's not the option that we would like to choose. Okay, but it is an option. So you're putting all your options down on the table. Acknowledge alternatives. The day you have to acknowledge them. Make sure at the end of the day, when if, you, if you're buying a horse, if you're if you are voting on a horse to purchase, make sure you don't end up with a camel or a donkey because you've got too many alternatives and instead of voting on a, on a screen, now you're talking about live streaming or iPads or some alternative. Do you understand? Make sure at the end of the day, that whereas you've acknowledged all the alternatives, that you are actually voting on the horse, not the camel, not the donkey, not the mule. I made that clear. The last part of this presentation that I want to give to you is Seven Habits of Highly Successful People by Dr. Stephen Covey. And I'm going to go through them rather quickly <clears throat> because they apply to all, to, to our boards and our committees and our councils and our churches. It helps if we have a, a, a set of habits that, for which we can bring our life together.
Have one, be proactive instead of reactive. Don't wait for something to fall apart before you fix it, okay? Don't be silent when you should speak. Don't speak when you should be silent. Be proactive. Pray, pray for the minister and family. Pray for the spiritual well-being of the church. Pray with thanksgiving for the whole body of believers and for individual believers. Don't just pray sick and pray for those who have just died in their families. Pray for the, pray for the spiritual well-being. Pray for the health. Pray for the well-being. Um, praying for the sick is good, yes, but being proactive will call for us to um, pray positively. Be proactive by talking. Talk positively about the minister. Talk positively about the committees. Talk pos positively about the boards and the congregation. Talk positively about the church. Every opportunity you get. Be proactive by encouraging the board members to pray for those in leadership. Encouraging the, the congregation to pray for the board and the leadership. Encourage the members to talk positively about what is going on. <clears throat> Be proactive by communicating the vision, the values, the goals and objectives of the upcoming season. That is an option. We don't have to keep on tearing each other down. Be proactive on by acting on the vision, act on the values, act on the goals and the objectives of your congregation. Act in ways to bless others in your thoughts, particularly in your thoughts. Act in ways to bless others in your words and act to bless others in your actions. Those are options. We kind of seem to have forgotten that, but they are options. Habit two is begin with the end in mind. Don't be like this hamster, always looking forward, but actually not getting anywhere. Very focused. Where's she going? This is my favorite. Got a phone running like crazy. Where's he going? Just because you're going fast and got a phone in your hand, a smartphone in your hand is not a magic indicator that you are going somewhere. Have you ever been on a bumper car? You can crash into people without hurting yourself and without injuring their, their car. You can, you can do that all day long. But where you been? Begin with the end in mind. Okay, where do you want to go? Okay, let's go to Orlando. Let's go to Disney World in Orlando. Well, what's going to get us there? Is this going to get us there? Not in that present condition, especially if there isn't any water underneath it. It is a boat, but this boat is not going to take us where we're going. Begin with the end in mind. Quite, I would just as soon go in this bad boy and go to Orlando, see everything I want to see, come back in this bad boy and feel like I've had a really good time. I'm just saying. I'm just saying this will get me where I'll be. with the end in mind. This will get me where I'm going. I might not be able to afford it. That's another concern. But the idea that it will take me where I'm going is a good idea. Habit three, put first things first. It doesn't matter how good of a roof builder you are. If you don't have a foundation, and walls and windows, your very good building skill is almost irrelevant. Make sure you don't put the cart before the horse. That is hard work, but this is my favorite. Even the horse thinks that this is funny. In life, we have rocks, we have pebbles, and we have sand. Okay. The rocks would be your character, your education, your family, your spouse, your children, your church, your communication with your, your family, your integrity, your honesty, and such things. Those would be the rocks. The pebbles would be... <clears throat> making sure you get your, your child to her soccer game or, or make sure that you, your wife is picked up 
or your husband is shirt is is pressed for the next day that you've done things that you your family is taking care of you you're they're fed and so on the sand would be the time you spend on TV, the time you spend going doing video games, the time you spend doing things that are fun and not wrong, but they just take up too much of your time. So here's an example of the rocks are in there. You can't see the rocks on account of the sand. The rocks are there, no question, but they are absolutely overrun with things that make no difference. They're fun, fun things that just don't add up to anything. In this one, you see the set. The, the fun things are all here at the bottom and the foundation. And you've got some pebbles and you've got some rocks, but look at these rocks outside here. Some of the rocks didn't even make it in there. They didn't make it in, in, in there. The, some of the most important parts of your life, the most important people, the most important ways of being are not even in your jar. There's a problem. From the, from the previous slide, I would say get a bigger jar, like you have here. Put the rocks in first. Pay attention to the things that are most important first. Then put the pebbles in. And then the sand, then you've got time to watch TV, you've got time to do your video, and you've got time to eat that tenth piece of, that tenth chocolate chip cookie. You know, but do the rocks in first, and then there's room for everything. Think win-win. Everybody doesn't have to be wrong in order for you to be right. The consequences of not admitting when we are wrong is that we tend to cover it up or lie about it or demean the character of the person who, who knows that you said something wrong or did something wrong and you want to divert, divert the attention from it. Think win-win. Um, I'm thinking of a husband and wife who want to go on a vacation. They want, she wants to go spend a week with her, her mother. He wants to go fishing in a, lake, in a lake. And so he feel, she feels like fishing is boring and he feels like going and spending a week with her mother is torture. So he doesn't want to do that. So they put things through, how can we make this a win-win situation? How can we make it win for you and how can we make it win for me? Well, come to find in the place where her mother lived, there was a lake district not very far from where she lived. Never seen it before, didn't know it was there, but they found it because they were intentional about being a, making this a win-win situation. So they said, okay, let's go to, the, to this lake district. We'll hotel at the lake district instead of staying with my mom. We'll go and visit your mom and one day you come fishing with me. How's that? So they think win-win. And it turned out to be a really good visit with the mother. And she actually caught some fish. And so everyone was happy. It was a win-win situation. Seek first to understand. And then seek to be understood. Others have valid opinions, valid thoughts that they can share with us. And sometimes we want to just let that gloss over us because we don't understand where they're coming from. But if you take the time to try to understand somebody, you probably will find that they have something valuable to add to the context of what is being spoken of. Here's another picture. We don't all see the same thing the same way. We did this earlier in the presentation, but here's another one. What do you see? Do you see one woman? Or do you see the old woman? Or do you see both? Hopefully you see both. Try to understand what the picture is saying. Try to understand <clears throat> what the other people are saying. Ask, ask relevant questions to help you with understanding where they're coming from and then and then value it value it do you see both do you see both now do you see either the young woman or the old woman my dad used to say even a clock that is no longer working is right not once but twice a day 
city, habit six, synergy. We are more than the sum of ours. We can have, we can have all, we can line up all the parts of this car in our garage. All the parts, line them up. They tell me there's 2,000 parts in a car. You can line them up in your garage. Where's that car going? Even if not one single piece is missing, where's it going? Nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. There's some parts. Where's that car going? Nowhere. We are more than the sum of our parts. I'm thinking about a cake, and this is also begin with the end in mind, but I'm thinking about a cake. You can line your, your ingredients up, line them up. Here's your eggs, here's your flour, here's your sugar, here's your baking powder, here's your baking soda, here's your carrots if it's a carrot cake, and two sticks of butter. Line them up. Do you have a cake? No. You just have ingredients. Yes? Then if you were to taste each one of those, I'm not into eating raw eggs myself, I'm just saying, I don't like the taste of flour, sugar's got too many calories in it, it's butter, yuck, soda, baking soda, mm -mm. Not, no, no, none of, those par none of those ingredients by themselves are palatable. So then we beat them all up together, and now we have a batter. Do we have a cake? No, we have a batter. You got to put it in the oven and bake it at a certain at a certain temp for a certain amount of time. But this the cake is absolutely delicious because we are better together. It's going to take pulling the parts together in order to in according to protocol and according to what's right and in the right order to make all the parts cohesive enough to be useful. Those parts can make this car, but it takes more than the parts to make the car. We are better, we are stronger together. <clears throat> then the last one has two parts. Use the right tools. Have you ever tried to turn a screw with a butter knife? It can be done. It can be done, but it's a whole lot easier to use a screwdriver. Use and then, have you ever used a perfectly good shoe to try to drive a nail? <clears throat> you could put a hole in the bottom of that shoe, and the nail will come right through the right through that good what was a good shoe. It's much easier to use a hammer to drive a nail. Much easier. Use the right tools. And then, with the tools, sharpen the tool, sharpen the saw. I had some yard work done just very recently, and the the gardener had a, very, had a very sharp machete, and he just went, pshoing, and, and the, the big branch came off, pshoing, another branch came off. The machete I had was very old, and 17 chops did not take off the limb in question. You, you sharpen the saw. How do I sharpen the saw? We read good books. Be a student of the word. Pray and meditate. Someone else's lack of planning does not have to be your crisis. It's their crisis. Let them deal with their crisis. It's not your crisis. Don't make it your crisis. We've got crises of our own. We don't need somebody else's. Be pro proactively take care of yourself. Spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. Take care of you. That's how you sharpen the soul. Give and receive. Giving and receiving are two sides of the same coin. You can't just give, 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 give. You have to receive sometimes so, you can, so there can be some balance in your life. Okay? Then express commitment to your spouse. If you can only handle 12 things a day and there's 15 things on your agenda, make sure your spouse isn't number 16. Make sure they're in the first five. Work smart and sleep deeply. Thrash out what it means to lead a holy life before God. Thrash out what it means to live a balanced life by yourself, at 
home, at work, and at church. And as I come to the conclusion of this, of this presentation, I want to say God bless us to understand that individual character matters. When we're making decisions for the church, individual character matters. God bless us to understand that we are interdependent and interdependent by design, by God's design. We are better together. We need each other. Lone wolves don't help us very much. We need each other. And even though we have some miserable people, some difficult people to work with, we need each other. They need us and we need them. We are better together when we have worked ourselves first. When we continuously work on ourselves, we make a better team. We're a better team player. We're a better board member. We are a better person individually and we are a better church collectively. Our CBCs are better when the seven habits of highly successful people, and I would say highly successful boards, are in the driver's seat of everything that we do. Amen, amen, amen. Here you have a training exit slip, so you can go here and there's 23 questions to be answered, each worth 10 points. A perfect score is 150 out of 230 because I have to read your short answers and give you a score out of 10 for each question that you want. So I trust that this has been helpful and informative and will help you help us all together to be on the same page, to move forward in our churches and in our lives and glorify the Father who is in heaven. God bless you and God bless you the Bahamas Conference of this church.